the revelation which demons speak are not in rhythm with the record of Christ. The revelations which demons speak is only in rhythm with the individual themselves. And that's where you have a lot of these individual ministries. Individual ministries are these people who are listening to seducing spirits and are walking in rhythm with their aspiration. They're not walking in rhythm with the record of Christ, nor with the stewardship which God has sanctified. You can see that the revelation which they have received was not born of the voice of the Lord. It was not spoken to them by God at all. It had to do with Satan speaking through the window of their imagination about themselves. And many saints have been ensnared by the words of Satan as he continues to communicate through that window of the imagination. And people, not understanding these kingdoms, fall prey to Satan and take on his perspective. Instead of building the house of God, they're trying to build wealth for themselves. And when they achieve the goal of that wealth, uh, they look at that as God-ordained. God authorized, but not God-sanctified. There's a difference again. Even Balaam received large amounts of wealth for his prophecies. But Balaam was never used as a choice vessel in regarding righteousness. Balaam was always used in the negative, in regarding uh, affronting Moses and God's plan for the children of Israel by evil counsel. And we can see the same thing today concerning ministers of righteousness who claim callings on their own ministry, but yet are out of step and out of rhythm with the plan of God. They're still preaching a gospel of health and wealth. And they're affronting God and regarding God's choices. They're always trying to get God to change his mind. And that's what the children of Satan do, because that's what Satan did. Satan, in the presence of God, affronted God. He wanted God to change his mind. They, in regarding the, the creation of Adam and this, other, and this dimension, which we're in right now. So all the children of Satan do the same thing today. They select a text of the Bible and affront God to twist God's arm in order to bring to pass their own desire or their own lusts. That's turning the grace of God to lasciviousness. Instead of being thankful, they're murmuring and complaining. Now we know what happens to murmurs and complainers because they, they enter not into the promise of God because of unbelief. They refused to take on the responsibility of the covenant, but they always affronted God concerning their immediate needs and pleasures. And God, of course, because he's a gracious God and a compassionate God and a God full of mercy, as the scriptures declare, yet they took advantage of that. Because when God rained manna from heaven, Moses ate of the manna, but he did not affront God with it. And when God rain uh, also brought the quail, Moses partook of that, but he didn't complain. But the children of Israel, those which, were, which fell in the wilderness because of unbelief, always affronted God regarding the promises, but never taking their own responsibility of the covenant. And we can see this kind of gospel being preached today, where people are, are make, singing songs and, and making vows to God and concerning his promises, but never humbleness of mind regarding the covenant. They're prancing up and down the stage and continually uh, trying to wrestle God and the minds of the people into a position of agitation for, uh, you see, embracing the promises. But the, the voice of faith is not loud. The voice of faith is humble. Because the, the vessel that gave the grace of God is God himself, who is also humble. And Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. So we can see that God was identifying himself as meek and lowly in heart. That Jesus' ministering was not loud, obnoxious, nor affronting God, nor condemning man. And yet the gospel is being preached from the pulpits today is doing just that. It's loud obnoxious, affronting God, and condemning man. That is the voice of Satan speaking. Because Satan always packages his gospel with promises, but never with faith and covenant. When I talk about faith and covenant, we're talking about utilizing those things which God has sanctified by Jesus' blood. When he said, eat of me and drink of me, he was identifying himself as a point of contact for your faith to be expressed with. When the apostles wrote their epistles, you notice the things that they were addressing had nothing to do with the comfort zones in regarding uh, those who they're writing to. He did, they did not say to the poor, get rich. He never said to the poor to get rich. Never. And in fact, uh, when you see these epistles, they never talked about us concerning finding the five steps of getting a healing from God. Okay? Or the ten steps of how to get wealth. 
how to get the wealth of the sinner. You will not find that in these epistles. Yet the ministers of a righteousness continually try to bridge these covenants together. The covenant of Moses had to do with the earth-bound kingdom. The covenant of Jesus Christ is the heaven-bound kingdom. And when they tried to bridge these two covenants, the earth-bound and the heaven-bound, he's saying, I love Jesus, but give me your wealth. I love Jesus, but give me the health. They have entwined these two covenants together, and by doing these things, they're not rightly dividing the word of God. And this is what the Apostle Paul cautioned the church about as concerning rightly dividing the word. When he said rightly dividing the word, he wasn't talking about as concerning the Greek text, uh, making sure that you understand the tense of the Greek text or the accents of the Hebrew writings. He wasn't talking about that. He was talking about as concerning keeping the covenants separate and understanding the work of the Spirit. But the ministers of righteousness today uh, try to bridge these two covenants. That's the golden calf. The golden calf in the house of Baal is the Jesus see, of those which are not converted. These are the unconverted believers. The unconverted believers bow down to the golden calf because they want their aspirations to be confirmed by God. But I got news for you. God will not confirm your aspirations. You notice that before a sports event that the teams are praying, whether it be basketball, baseball, football, and they're praying and asking God, Dear Lord, stand on behalf of our, uh, see, of our team that we can win. I'll give you some advice. God is not on either side. Because God does not enter to the aspiration of either side. God will not enter the prayer of aspirations. But he does enter into the prayer of faith. And faith is in covenant. And covenant has to do with regeneration and renewing of the mind. Covenant has to do with concerning the foundation of Christ being laid within the heart for you a, being a fruit bear to God. That's what God is involved with. And herein is my Father glorified, Jesus said, that you bear much fruit. Never did Jesus say, herein is my Father glorified, that your pockets are filled with wealth, and that, your, your, that the rooms of your house are filled with, or stacked with gold, okay, and that you drive three Mercedes, and that you have all these beautiful planes, and that you go around and say, this is my Jesus. Well, sure, everybody, the, the carnal mind, and they're going to honor the idols, because he says, your idols are big. We love your idols. That's what Nebuchadnezzar did when he made an image of himself. Nebuchadnezzar is, was the oath of the Chaldeans, was the oath of Babylon. And if anyone went and bowed down to this image, he was considered as a transgressor. Well, if you don't bow down to God, you're a transgressor. You have to cast away your idols of gold. You have to cast away the idols of your own issues and your relationships and embrace the one true God through covenant. And so when we say the word covenant, we're talking about the government of God's house. Not the governments of this world, the government of God's house. For Jesus said of himself, my kingdom comes not with observation. And then he said also, my kingdom is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. This is the kingdom which we preach. But the kingdom which is being uh, preached on television and on other radios is not the kingdom of God. It's the kingdoms of this world. Because it's the issues of this world. Okay, when the, when a preacher preaches in regarding the issues of this world, that's the kingdoms of this world. The treasures of this world is what they want to preserve, and their golden calf is where they want people to gather around and worship and confirm. So it's either you're in the house of Bell or in your house of God. If you're in the house of Bell, you're an unconverted believer. Being an unconverted believer, you must seek the Lord and according to the terms which Christ provided them for you to seek Him with. Okay, so you got the government, the truth, and the spirit, prayer, preaching, prophecy, gifts, callings, and graces of God. These experiences and the tokens are of the kingdom of God, the invisible kingdom. Okay, the invisible kingdom. Now, God is able to bridge your signature in regarding your state of life. He's able to reverse the judgments of condemnation to the judgments of blessing. He's able to remove the curses and, give you the, and, and also give you the tokens of his blessing. But you must come in covenant with God. And then the Lord will test your heart. Okay, now, so we go back here to 1 John. And then we talk about the covenant. We talk about the commandment. Now, commandment has to do with an ordered activity. So you might want to make a note on that. Commandment means ordered activity. Judgments means a set policy. God sets policy according to his commandments. Okay, my commandments, you know, an ordered activity as so regard to his judgments. His judgments are set forth in the earth every day. 
Okay, it's set forth in regarding the, the path of the sun and the moon and the stars. God's judgments are, are upon the waters. Regarding the turbulence, the direction of the currents, the, the breeding of the fish. His judgments in the earth and regarding also uh, sowing time and harvest time. His judgments are also in your heart and regarding the direction that you're taking. Are you taking the direction of your own aspirations? Then you're sinning against God. Do not call your aspirations a gift of God's grace because God's grace is not in the aspiration at all. The aspiration is the projection of one's self-worth, which works with what we call the three F's, flattery, fantasy, and finance. Those of the world hear the things of this world, as the Apostle Paul also wrote about. For what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knows no man but the spirit of God. You cannot know God on the grounds of your own experience of life. God provides you an experience. As also uh, Abraham said to Isaac, the Lord himself will provide a sacrifice. God will provide the tokens of your faith. But you must humble yourself to the voice of the Lord. You must seek him with all your heart. There are no free trips to heaven. And there's no tokens apart from suffering. As the Apostle Paul again brings out concerning the circumcision of the heart. The circumcision of the heart and the mind. Okay, so the Apostle John goes on in verse 2, For life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness. That has to do with the empowerment of this pattern. The witness is the empowerment of the pattern. The empowerment of the pattern in the church that you're going to, in the pew that you're sitting in, or the chair that you're sitting in, are you experiencing the empowerment of God's pattern as concerning the living record of Christ? If you're not, it's because you're in the wrong house. In the house where I live, which is in the house of our Lord Jesus Christ, I experience His grace every day in dreams, words of knowledge, many manifestations of His tokens because God promised this and I'm experiencing this. Why aren't you experiencing this? Because you're in the wrong house. As long as you're in the house of Bell, you have to try to create your own experiences. And this is what we can see in the pageantry, the clapping, the loud music, the loud singing, whether it be in the message just being preached and try to move the hearts of the people. The grace of God needs no assistance from the aspirations of man. But when, the, when, when a false gospel is being preached from the pulpit, those which are communicating that message of this world always trying to incite the feelings and the passions of the people in the pew. Why are they doing that? Okay, when the people in the pew feel their uh, emotions being ignited, they think that's the Holy Ghost. It's not. It's not the Holy Ghost. All that is, this has to do with that. Your, the things that are being preached in the pulpit is lies within sympathy of your own nature. Okay? And you're communicating those things which are common to man. Because that's the things of the spirit of this world. That the spirit of God does not work through that vessel nor in that avenue. When Jesus preached the gospel, when he preached concerning his record and the fulfillment of those things of Moses, Jesus did not address concerning the issues and conflicts of man. Jesus did not tell the Jews of how to cast off the yoke of Rome. He did not tell them any kind of secret plans or of how to, to resolve the famine in their land or any, or any flaws of their economics or addressing their civil laws. Jesus didn't even touch any of those things. All he says is render to Caesar the things which are Caesar and the things which be God's unto God. In other words, what are you supposed to be rendering God? Your faith. What do you render to Caesar? Your money. Okay, and let's keep it that way. Render to Caesar what he requires, and you render to God what he requires. God requires faith in the heart. The Bible says, the just shall walk by faith and not by sight. Walking by sight, which means you're, uh, the things that you see are not sanctified. By faith, which means the things which are invisible. Because it's the invisible things of him which we work with. Because God's kingdom is invisible. Now for the life is manifested and we have seen it. The manifestation regarding the, the true record which is Jesus himself. And bear witness and show unto you this living pattern. That eternal life. That which all the, the law and the prophets spoke and pointed towards. That eternal life. Not that which is earth bound. But that which is heaven bound. Not that of the first Adam. But that of the second Adam. Not that of the flesh. But that which is of the spirit. Not that which is temporal, but that which is eternal. That eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. So God has provided tokens to his Son, Jesus Christ, in order that we can behold the face of the Lord and walk according to the compass of his throne. 
When I say the compass of the stone, I say that our, the direction of our faith is in cadence with him now. When we were in the world, we spoke of the world, we thought of the world, and we and our, all the issues of this life were the yoke which we bore. Okay? But now God has circumcised those things from us. As Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Being crucified with Christ, which means I'm circumcised from the issues of this world. The things of this world have been assigned to the sinners, but the things of God has been assigned to the righteous. What kingdom are you in and what house are you in? Are you still trying to resolve racial issues? Are you still trying to resolve conflicting relationships? Are you still trying to resolve the economics of this world? Did you know God resolves all those things? That's why you must come in covenant. God resolves those things. But that's the curse which God has put upon the minds of those which are dark. Okay, because they're trying to wrestle God into positions confirming their aspiration. See, uh, the things which man has experienced would have been resolved long time ago if they would have came in covenant with God. But because they would walk contrary to God, God walked contrary to them. And when God walks contrary to you, he puts mischiefs upon every aspiration that you have. Mischiefs has to do with he puts plagues, diseases, brings war, okay, brings economic upheaval, famine, pestilence, incurable disease and incurable cancers. These are mischiefs which God has assigned. For the Lord testified himself, I am the Lord. I change not. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. That's what God testified of himself. I kill and I make alive. Satan does it. I do it. Okay, Satan's power only lies in deception and that is, has to do with your perception of life. If your perception of life centers upon your peace and security, you're in the wrong house. If your perception of life is from the throne of God, then the peace of God will reign in your heart. But as long as you're tethered to Satan's kingdom, your perception will always be restricted to your own self, your own feelings, your own little kingdom which you're trying to build for yourself, your own aspiration, your own career ladder, how much money you have, your peace and security, how long you're going to live. And that you can't answer. You could die tomorrow. Okay? You do not have power over your life. And God proves it every day. When people depart from this dimension and stand before his judgment seat and be prepared to be judged in that last day, they have nothing to offer to God but excuses. That's all they have to offer is his excuses. They don't have the tokens of life within their hearts. Without the token of life, without Christ's circumcision, without the tokens of your overcoming, you're not going to enter God's kingdom. You cannot enter God's kingdom on, a, on somebody else's personality. You cannot enter God's kingdom on somebody else's good works. It's between you and God. But you have to come to God according to his terms. You cannot set the terms concerning engagement. God has already done that through his son. Look what Jesus suffered in order to provide a covenant for you. Have you disregarded Jesus' blood for your aspiration? Shame on you, disregarding Jesus' blood for your aspiration. The Apostle Paul writes about that. Okay, as concerning those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and the powers of the world to come and the good word of God, if they shall fall away, it is impossible to renew them again in repentance, seeing they crucified in themselves the Son of God afresh and put them to an open shame. And that's what you're doing. By resisting the grace of God, which is a sinner, because that's what sinner means, grace resistor. The, to define the word sinner means grace resistor. If you're resisting the grace of God, you're a sinner. Okay? If you're living by your aspiration and principle, you are wicked. If your soul is absent of the fruit of God, you are ungodly. If you're not walking according to God's commandments, you are living lawlessly. As the Apostle Peter also said, living in riotousness. Okay, they riot in the daytime. They preach a gospel that's contrary to God and affront God, insult his dignities, speaking evil of dignities, and they work with fables. That is wickedness, ungodliness, lawlessness. This is a sin unto death. There is no fellowship with the ungodly. Because how can uh, light commune with darkness? It can't. You can't put these two powers together. Okay, and he goes on here. Eternal life which was with the Father, being pure and holy, and was manifested unto us. Which gospel, uh, the Apostle John says here, this is what we are preaching to you. And this is what I am preaching to you today in regarding this gospel. This is the true record of Jesus Christ. It was also written by the prophets that in the last days, those which want to restore faith within the true gospel will be, be, be spoken against as being evil. 
Who would speak evil of such a thing like that? Those which are mischievous, the hypocrite, the ungodly, the rebellious, and the sinner. They will speak against those that try to renew faith in the hearts of the people. And of course, the apostles wrote about this. As Paul said, After my decease shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock to draw disciples after themselves. Even the apostle Paul knew, and the apostle Peter wrote about the same thing concerning the last days, the end times which we're in right now. Many are talking about Christ, but they're not being a part of his kingdom, speaking evil of him. Now Jesus said that, in the last days many shall say that I'm Christ and should deceive many, that is speaking evil of him. Now the word evil has to do with faithlessness, false knowledge. Now false knowledge means uh, it, uh, it does not uh, possess the elements of strength. False knowledge weakens your faith. Truth strengthens your faith, but false knowledge weakens your faith. It always brings the soul into contempt and keeps the mind in the state of being confounded. Okay, confounded, which means split in thinking and scattered in thought. You don't know who, what is your right hand or your left hand. You don't know who's speaking the truth, me or your pastor. Okay, that's being confounded. But if you listen with a, ear, a circumcised ear and a circumcised heart, then the grace of God will gain interest and you will find life and God will baptize you in the Holy Spirit right here. Okay, then we go down to verse 3. See, that which we have seen and heard, uh, as the Apostle John is bringing out here, that which we have seen concerning the record of Christ and that which we heard concerning this witness, the tethering and tutoring of angels. All right, when we speak of angels, we're speaking uh, as concerning a form of communication. When the world speaks of angels, they speak of angels in a form of you can say amusement. Okay, they speak in form of amusement. They paint pictures of angels. They have angels, you know, on their stained glass windows. Or they have angels carved in the pew. Or okay, they wear angels around their, their 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 neck or in their ears. Okay, we're not talking about the angels of amusement. Okay, as if you're going to some kind of spiritual carnival. We're talking about angels that are messengers of His grace. Jesus is the one that spoke about this when He spoke to Nathaniel, because Nathaniel confirmed Jesus by the grace of his lips. How do you know me? Nathanael said. And Jesus said, before Andrew called you, I saw you there under the fig tree. What was he doing? He was praying. I'm your answer to prayer. Nathanael responded to that. You are the Christ. You're the Son of God. You're the one that we've been looking for, as Moses wrote about. You're that one. Then Jesus said, from this point on, you're going to have a gift of discerning of spirits. You're going to see the angels of, of heaven, of God, ascending and descending upon the Son of Man ministering angels who attended jesus when he was in the garden praying and according to the gospel of luke an angel appeared to him and comfort him the angel doesn't come and throw his arms around him the angel came there and spoke and communicated concerning that that those things which are now about ready to befall him that he was continually in rhythm with his father what did jesus say and when he was being assaulted and affronted by the pharisees and uh, those which are taken coming out to take him prisoner well, when he said, do you not know that there's 12 legions of angels right here, that they can stand on my part and defend me? Jesus spoke a lot about angels. I also talk a lot about angels. We see ministering spirits and angels every day. As they continue to communicate this grace, that is a sign guarding this pattern of truth. A man that has a true calling of God will confirm to concerning the true record of Christ. But those which are claiming a calling of God, but not, but not bringing the soul into subjection unto his covenant, they're not the true vessels. They're not the ones that are sanctified. Okay? Their fellowship remains only with their person, their things, their flattery, their splendid billings, their splendid cars, okay? the boasting of their membership, and how much money they have in the bank. Okay? That's the spirit of the world. I'm giving you understanding so that you have eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to understand okay? that those which are coming over the which are speaking to you, these televangelists, telepreachers, and some of them, I don't even know what their calling is because they never really say what their calling is anyway. They continually try to preach to your psychology. Their preaching has to do with addressing your passion and not addressing your faith. When I say addressing the passion, it's, it's talking about that you have to weigh everything that they're saying on the scale of whether it's going to work for you or not. Is that how Jesus preached? No, Jesus didn't preach that way. Jesus did not preach the man's psychology. He spoke the word of God. Okay, he gave them a pattern for their faith to be expressed with. He fulfilled all things of Moses and the prophets in himself. That's why he said, drink you all of it. Drink you all of it and partake of this. This is me. All right. 
And let's go on to verse 3 now. This pattern, the true pattern which we have seen in the record of Christ and have heard, declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship with us. Now take a highlighter and highlight the word fellowship. And that's an important word. When you're in church, what do you talk about? Do you speak about your issues of life or you talk about concerning the exchanging of God's charity? Hey, I know if you're in the house of Baal, everything's going to center around your struggles, your hopes, your projections, your probabilities. Okay, but not faith, and not faith and covenant. In the house of God, everything centers upon the exchanging of the knowledge of God in covenant. And that's why our vessels are full. Is your vessel full or empty? Okay, and Jesus, again, gave an analogy of this. He asked concerning five wise virgins and five foolish virgins. The five wise had oil in their vessels, but the foolish didn't. Then at midnight, when the Lord was again to open the door, the five foolish said to the wise five, why don't you give us some of your oil? After all, ours has gone out. But the five wise said to the five foolish, I'm sorry, why don't you just go into the store at midnight over here? Why don't you go to the store and buy it for yourself? Is your vessel full or is your vessel empty? If you're in the house of Bell, you're, I know your vessel's empty. Because okay? that's why you're always looking for breakthroughs. That's why you're always looking for new wells. That's why you're always looking for the next conference. That's why you're always reading the next book. Because you're trying to fill that void within you. Okay, and you're feeling the absence of God's power and his peace. Okay, you have to exercise your faith to enter into his rest. And faith must be on the terms of the covenant that Jesus spilled his blood for. If you're not going to use the, the, the terms of this covenant, no matter what you pursue, your name is not going to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Okay, it's going to be written uh, not in the, in, the, in the Book of the Living. It's going to be written in the Book of the Dead. Okay, so that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. This is where fellowship exists, he says, through the stewardship which I am giving to you. Fellowship, an exchange of substance. So I just define fellowship for you, an exchange of substance. Okay, and this is what John heard Jesus tell him, that you love one another as I have loved you. And so my father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. So Jesus wasn't talking about, as concerning again, a, a passionate feeling towards each other. He's talking about is concerning the knowledge which I'm speaking to you, I want you to share with one another in your priesthood. That's what he's saying in fellowship. Okay, we're all partaking of the meat of the altar. Okay, the, because those that wait at the altar partake of the altar, the, of the flesh of the altar. And we're, at, we're, we're waiting at the altar of Christ, so we partake of his sacrifice. We until they partake of his flesh. We drink his blood and eat his meat at this altar. But the altar of the Lord is not in this earth. The altar of the Lord has been identified as being in heaven, as you see in the book of Revelation. Okay, in the book of Revelation, there's where the altar is at. So if you're partaking of physical elements for your fellowship, you're drinking damnation to yourself, as the Apostle Paul warned about. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, many die. A lot of people dying in your church, and yet they're trying to plead the blood, or see, bind the devil, okay, claim healing for themselves, and yet they still die. That's because they're eating the wrong communion. They, they must eat not the communion of the first covenant. They must eat of the communion of the second covenant, which is in heaven. The altar is in heaven. Okay? And this is what uh, the Apostle Paul said, okay, where he says, Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace. Where? In heaven. Okay? In heaven. Not on earth. In heaven. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is your time of need. Do you need to set your face to the throne above, to the altar above, not the altar beneath. The altar beneath is in utility it's marked by time but the author which is above is eternal that's where eternal life lies in christ that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly now i like the word truly there in verse three the word truly has to do is concerning a verity of absoluteness a verity of absoluteness our fellowship as that which is sprung from god himself it springs from him okay the living waters our fellowship is in the living waters, okay, not in the waters of Jordan, okay, but in living waters from above. The living waters, truly, an assertion of absolute correctness. Our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And you notice again, he separates the two. The Spirit separates the two here for distinction, the understanding the relationship exists only because of your obedience to faith. So if you want a relationship with God, if you want to experience the things which are from above, as the Apostle Paul bring, writes about, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, okay, the nine gifts, the nine fruits of the Spirit, the five callings, the stewardship, the foundation of truth, the fellowship of the Spirit, the unity of the Spirit, and regarding your prayer life, praying in the Spirit, praying in tongues, 
prophecy, okay, which we call level one prophecy. If you want to experience God involved in your life, then you have to use these tools, these tokens. These tokens are tokens of your life. By these tokens, you're going to overcome. Okay, you're going to overcome yourself, you're going to overcome Satan, and you'll overcome the world. Okay, but yourself is the biggest barrier. Because uh, in, in the kingdom of darkness, Satan per has portrayed an image of himself in your soul. Well, how did he portray an image of himself in his soul? Because Satan used the pastels and the paintbrushes of envy. Okay, he used the pastels and the paintbrushes and the, the ink regarding strife, maliciousness, emulation, division, sedition, adultery, fornication, the, the acts of the flesh, the acts of the passions, the acts of the intelligence, okay, the intellect, the lust of the flesh, okay, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, how we feel, what we think, and the pursuit of your own happiness. Okay, the pursuit of happiness is not the happiness of God. It's the pursuit of your own completion and clarity and closure. You're not going to find happiness in pursuing the things of this world because the things of this world are, are perishables. Okay, and when you die, you can't take that with you. The only thing you can take with you in the next dimension is yourself and if you're christian the tokens of god's work within your soul but you're not allowed into the course of the lord with an empty vessel we already saw that that's why the lord said at the door depart from me i don't know who you are and as he said it also in our place depart from me you that work iniquity an empty vessel is iniquity if you don't bear the marks of christ the tokens of the lord if you're not bearing these things within you carrying them and having them nurtured within you by the terms of this covenant then, according to the book of Revelation, chapter 3, you're going to be wretched, miserable, poor, and blind, and naked. And if you want fellowship, you must open the door of your heart right now to the knowledge which I am giving to you. If you want a relationship, a true relationship with God, and cry out to Him with all your heart, a willingness to serve Him, not for the purpose of indulgences of your aspiration or your principle or trying to resolve your issues. You want to know Him because He is God. Okay. It's not the, for the purpose of trying to bring God down to the level of being your playmate. God is not your playmate. He is your creator. But God will communicate to you on a level as concerning his work within you. And we'll be reading more about that as we go on here as concerning little children. We may also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. So I like the word Father and I like the word Son there. Because okay, the word Father has to do with the empowerment of his witness. And the Son has to do with the establishment and foundation of his record. The establishment and foundation of his record is the Son. Well, when did Jesus give us this record? Okay, when the time that, God, that the Father took ownership of him in his baptism, where he said these words, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. From that point on, the Spirit led Jesus, not the devil, the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So we can see that Jesus in the wilderness engaged with Satan for the purpose of the restrictions which he assigned to himself. God assigned restrictions to himself. As Paul brings out in Philippians there, in Philippians chapter 2, being the form of God, though not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even a death at a cross. Okay, we know that there just out of Philippians there, in Philippians chapter 2. Okay, now I'm back here in First John. God restricted himself only to the expression of his record to give us a pattern for our faith. That's why he did that. And Satan, of course, tempted him in the three areas which you are tempted with every day. The lust of the flesh, which has to do with your feelings, your personal securities. The lust of the eyes, which has to do with the pursuit of intellectualism, ever learning but never able to come to knowledge of the truth. False science, that's intellectualism. You think that you're going to achieve salvation by trying to intrude into syntax or trying to piece together a way of salvation for yourself. See, that's the lust of the eyes. Okay, and the religions of this world are stuck within that loop and are cycles of death because they're trying to find God through the lust of the eyes. You can't. The eye of the flesh will never see the record of God. Only the eye of faith sees the record of God. That's why you must be born again. Okay, and then you have where Jesus was uh, confronted with Satan on the high mountain. When Satan was showing uh, Jesus all the kingdoms of this world, the 13 princes of Satan's kingdom, and the ruling princes that had 
the, the domination of the minds of those under, underneath them. Okay, that's what's called principalities and powers of the air. Okay, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, as the Apostle Paul writes about. Okay, so Satan showed Jesus all these powers I'll give to you. After all that was granted to me, that you gave me these orders before I fell. And being cast in this dimension, I took from Adam uh, through subtlety and through guile and by lie, I took from Adam these powers. And Adam subjected himself to me freely, which he's doing today. That's why the world is in gross darkness. Okay, that's why the world is gross darkness until Jesus came. And the day which sat in darkness saw a great light. Uh, it has to do with his redeeming knowledge. The redeeming knowledge. Jesus was giving them the knowledge for the purpose of their salvation, that they would see the kingdom of God, which is invisible, than the knowledge that he gave to them. And this is what I'm doing today. I'm giving you this knowledge that you can see and believe this invisible kingdom, in which God is making known today, for the, this time now, called the second eighth week, before the great tribulation of God's wrath unfolds. Okay, so here, Satan was challenging Jesus for the, uh, the aspiration of life, which has to do the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So Satan was promising Jesus, if you follow my counsel, I'll make you very, I'll make you a celebrity. I'll make everybody like you. I will give you talent. I will persuade people to believe in you. And you can see the same thing today. The, the false gospel is attracting those which want a Jesus, which is the golden calf. They want the golden calf Jesus. They don't want the true Jesus. They want the golden calf Jesus. These are the ones that are following the loud voices of these celebrity preachers. They will not hear the kingdom of God because those things which are being promised to them is what they're pursuing. They're not seeking God with covenant. They're pursuing promise with lust. These are those which will fall in the wilderness. They will fall in unbelief. They will not inherit the promise which you're pursuing after. They have estranged themselves from God because of their ignorance that is within their own heart. Okay, they have estranged themselves from God. Okay, they were illuminated for the purpose of their salvation, but then that illumination was darkened by false doctrine. And this is why the apostles writing these epistles is uh, they're bringing the saints back, bringing them back to this one foundation. For other foundation can no man lay than is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Okay, now we go on here. Hey, these things write we unto you. Now the apostle John is writing to those who are under his stewardship. That your joy may be full. Is your joy full? Now when he says the word joy may be full, he's not talking about it's concerning finding your happy place. He's talking about it's concerning the endurance of your faith. The answer will be manifested. Your joy will be full. The answer will be manifested. So he says that your joy may be full. Not half full. Full. Which means that there's no curse with it. Now the reason why I say that is because God did answer the cries of the children of Israel in the wilderness. When they say, can God provide a table for us here? As they murmured and complained about the circumstances of life. Does, uh, does their complaining and murmuring, does that sound like you? Okay, if it sounds like you, you need to reevaluate your form of Christianity and whose influence you're under. Whose yoke have you taken? Have you taken the yoke of the ungodly? Or are you going to take the yoke of Christ? The, the, ungodly, the, the word ungodly again means the fruitless ones. Okay, the fruitless ones which claim to know Jesus, yet his mark isn't manifested within their hearts. Because if the mark of Christ was in their hearts, it would be manifested through that fellowship. Okay, and their fellowship centers only upon the issues of man, the psychology of man, okay, and the, the, the things of this world. They are the ones that are misrepresenting Christ. They are blaspheming God because they're bringing God down to the level of their passion so that God will side in with their aspiration of life and receive the honor of this world. If the world honors you, you are standing in a position of condemnation. If the world despises you, then you're standing in the position of God's honor. Jesus said those same words to the religious minded. You are they which seek the honor of men and not the honor of God. That's what Jesus said now to the religious minded people of his time, the Pharisees, the most educated of his time, the doctors of the law. And Jesus says you honor God with your lips, but your heart is far from him. Does this sound like the worship service in your church in the house of Baal? That everybody's all enthusiastic about God, but yet no one is coming in covenant with God? The people can talk about the covenant and yet never come into the covenant. As I brought out last week, putting on Galilean sandals doesn't make you a first century Christian. Putting on sandals doesn't make you a Galilean. 
Putting on robes and carrying a staff doesn't make you a prophet. Imitating biblical characters doesn't make you a Christian. Coming in covenant does. You have to use those things which God has sanctified for your faith to be expressed with or you're going to die in your sins. Dying in your ignorance. Dying in your own confusion. Okay, now these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. This knowledge is necessary for your doxology and for your priesthood. That through this exchange of knowledge your fellowship would be sealed and that you will know the true God. This then is a message, he says, okay, which we have heard of him. Acts chapter 1 verse 2 talks about that. That Jesus, through the Holy Ghost, gave commandments unto his apostles. Apostles. He didn't say pro uh, prophet. Or he didn't say pastor. He didn't say televangelist. He didn't say evangelist. He didn't say teacher. He said apostles. Yet we have people today that are trying to sit in the, in the chair of the apostle without the anointing and the calling. Without that, they sit there for the purpose. Uh, it's like Jeroboam, the son of the bat. Okay, Jeroboam, the son of Bat, if you go back there to um, Kings, okay, you read about him when Israel was divided after the death of Solomon. Okay, Solomon's son Rehoboam, he emerged to be the second king okay, following Solomon. Okay, but God brought a division among the, the kingdoms of Israel. And he raised up another man, which was very industrious in his aspirations, named Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Uh, he found refuge there in a foreign land until the death of Solomon then he returned then they wanted to make him king now here's a man that had a calling of God but yet he did not bring God into the covenant he established the golden calf theories he started his own theology schools he was expanding his buildings he had an expanding program okay, and he was very popular and he built the house of Baal by these doctrines the children of Israel began to be confused of who the true God is now that's the state of the church today they don't know who the true God is. All those which are listening today, if you like to come in covenant with God, okay, if you, uh, you have to begin to seek God. You're going to have to also put aside the barriers of your former traditions and your mindset. And you're going to have to seek Him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Okay, if you want to come and covenant with God. Okay, well, thank you for listening today and continue, uh, continue to seek the Lord. His grace will abound towards those that seek Him with a, out of a pure heart. And this is Apostle Eric von Ersek here speaking. Have a good day in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be with you all. Amen.